Hello and welcome to Jim Dalton's presentation, Trading Price versus Trading Price with Context. It's Thursday, March 10th, 2016, currently 12 p. 12.01 p.m. Eastern. We'll go for about an hour. This webinar is being recorded. I am going to drag the PDF of the slides over to the handout section of GoToWebinar. They are not at the site right now, but um, you can grab them off the dashboard. And uh, Jim and I want to thank all of you for being here. It's great to see you. It's been a while since we've had one and for the public. And um, it's always great to see uh, familiar names um, coming around. So thank you very much. And uh, this webinar will be posted about an hour after we finish. So the recording will be up relatively quickly. YouTube, Vimeo, and at jdaltontrading.com. Okay, so have fun. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Hi, Jim. I know Jim is there. Um, did you hit your mute button by any chance, Jim? Okay, everyone, we seem to be having a technical difficulty, but we'll hang in there. Um, Jim is still on the webinar because his screen is showing. So I apologize for this, but it won't be long. Okay, Jim just texted me. He lost his audio. I don't know if that's bandwidth related, but um, very unusual. So please just give us a couple of minutes here and we'll be right with you. Hello again. We are having an audio issue with Jim's mic. So people coming in are asking if there's audio. We do have audio, but unfortunately, Jim doesn't have audio. So it's difficult to proceed. But we will be right with you, and we appreciate your patience.
Okay, everyone. There's a first time for everything. Um, we are um, going to work this out. Jim is uh, restarting his machine. Um, he's traveling, so uh, but he has his Verizon jetpack, which usually works great. So just give us some um, max time here, five minutes, and I'm going to put an audio broadcast out to everyone so everyone in the room will know and we're really sorry about this okay we're doing the best we can and we will be with you shortly Hello again, Julia here. We are still with you. We're sorry for this um, issue. Um, if you can just hang out and we will extend the webinar. We know you have busy lives though and there's a slot to watch this, but we're doing the best we can. Um, Jim is um, still getting online. Um, he's still rebooting, but I think uh, we'll be in business in a few minutes. And I will keep updating you, okay? It won't be long before we update you again. Thank you.
Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Again, Julia here. Yes, the webinar has started. We had Jim before the webinar and right up until we went live. So he is coming back. And I think he's close. Um, I really do. So hang in there with us, please. And we will be with you momentarily. This is a first, huh? I mean, we've had minor issues, but 14 minutes in and not having it resolved is highly unusual. So we appreciate your patience. We'll be right with you. Hello. 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 Now I was on mute. Okay, Jim. Ah, Great. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay. How impressive. Okay. So we just need to put your screen back on. Thank now, you, everyone. Trying... Okay. There comes my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, fabulous. Everyone, thank you very much. I'm going to make a note with the webinar recording this dead space for the first 15 minutes. So uh, we will ramp up from here. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. So uh, have, an, have fun, enjoy it, and I'll turn it to Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi. I'm sorry, folks. I don't have no idea what happened. I've had Internet since I checked into the hotel in Van Horn, Texas, and the absolute second that we were to start, I lost it but yet I show four bars. All right, um, but thank you for that, and let's uh, uh, talk about today. This is probably the most important conceptual webinar we've ever done, and then at the end, we're going to take it to the last few days and show you how real this information is. Trading price versus trading price with context. The Price with conventional charting is one-dimensional. Data points are open, high, low, close. Price is studied and examined using price-based momentum indicators, mathematical analysis such as Fibonacci, trend lines, moving average, uh, averages, relative strength, regressions, candles, you know, etc. And then they look at price-based patterns such as head and shoulders, uh, flags, pennants. That's the language that we have traditionally used before we started looking more intently at price with context. With uh, context, the market profile is a three dimension. Is three dimensional. It usually utilizes price as an advertising mechanism. Oh, that's all it is. It's an advertising mechanism. Time is the regulator of all opportunities. And the co combination of time and price provides a two-dimensional view of the marketplace. You think about a bar chart. A bar chart is a straight line. It's one dimension, price only. Once you add time to the equation, as you remember, the market profile, time is on the horizontal axis. Price is on the vertical axis. So you're comparing price a variable to time a constant and it gives you the shape of the profile. You now have a two-dimensional view of the market. Adding volume to this analysis gives you a three-dimensional view of the market. And we've got two ways to do time uh, volume. We can, act, we can look at actual volume, or we can estimate volume, meaning price times time equals volume. In other words, the longer, the more times the market has traded at a price in half hour periods, the more volume we assume is there. And we'll see that in a few minutes. The addition of time and volume adds exponential information to our analysis. That will make it harder for others. It will make it clearer for people that have an understanding of how to read and interpret that information. 
conventional charting is one dimensional and then the profile is three dimensional so we were talking earlier the longer you spend the more, we're going to assume that the lowest volume is on the high and the low with the heaviest volume being in the center price times time equals volume that gives us our third dimension market profile graphic this becomes important allows us to organize this data a graphic is a visual representation or frame used to organize information it's all it does if scientists have been doing this for years organizing information under a distribution curve in order to better study and interpret that information the markets two-way constant auction process or what we also call the continuous two-way auction process generates continual new and clarifying information throughout the trading session we use the profile to record that tremendous amount of information without the ability to organize this information you would drown in a pool of data a graphic helps you do the following and this becomes very key the graphic allows you to organize the data leading to a better and clearer description of the current market it increase it increases the clarity of what is going on and I hope that becomes very clear as we go through the examples that's what's going to bring this to life a graphic assistant in activating prior knowledge you will gain assistance in connecting prior concepts that you have seen in slightly altered states and we will talk about that too patterns it compares and contrasts prior settings and auctions and it better enables you enables you to recognize repetitive patterns I will bring all of this up when we go to the real life here in just a, just a few moments but if a key is organizing the data the key is recording the auctions two-way auction uh, two-way auction process and it's being able to graphically see what is going on rather than just be emotionally pulled back and forth with the constant uh, price movement in the market it enables you to better enable recognize market structure this leads to a better fuller trading imagination and again you're going to see that and you're going to see the why the low occurred in the market I don't know what's happened since we started the seminar but we had a clear spot had poor structure that was repaired this morning you'll see that in a few moments better and able to recognize and sort out important details and nuances once you understand basically how the market works the nuances are what makes a difference Brett Steenbarger in his new book psychology 2.0 has some figures in it that shows that traders short-term traders make money about 15 percent of the time on a yearly basis if you spread that out over a three-year basis the the profit is less than one percent the people that are profitable in that market if you're really going to learn to trade you have to look at things differently than has historic been historically been looked at at the market if you do what others have been doing in the way they've been doing you're going to fall into that pattern that we talked about have to say what what can I do differently the profile allows you to increase but the interpretation allows you to increase your ability to predict market behaviors and it eases your ability to plan for future trades okay what I'm going to do uh, is cover this last page and then we're gonna I have to bring back up my window trader because that went down as we were starting but the profile exposes texture surrounding each price or series of prices each price is separate however it is the other circumstances surrounding that price that gives us a real depth of understanding all right I've covered a lot of material very quickly and I'm sure to a lot of people it is very confusing but 
Let me take a couple of questions, Julia. While I am in the process of bringing my uh, my window trader back up, and we'll, and I can't do I, I can't have the market in front of me just yet, but I can answer questions relative to what we've just discussed. Please. Okay. Great. And everyone, I know the slides don't seem to be working. It must be go to webinar because I've dragged them there twice. So we're going to get a link for you. And um, you're going to just be able to click on the link or at least it's hard to do that in go to webinar that you can't copy and paste, at least on my end. But we'll do our best here to get you the slides. Um, we have some quite, uh, questions, Jim that are a little beyond what you just talked about. Um, so, Well, let's, let's try and take them and, and, and see. I mean, I can't, until I get the charts up, of the, the graphics, it's hard to address market questions, but go ahead and let's see what happens. Okay. Um, the bottom of March 3rd is a poor bottom, no buying tail. Price accepted there seems to be very misleading. High volume low. Big move up followed. Do you have any comments? Well, we're going to show that. We're going to show that uh, uh, very uh, shortly because that low was taken out today from March 3rd. The, the auction was not completed and that's another concept we're going to talk about here as we get into the uh, as we get into the examples and I'm incidentally I'm going to use March as we go through this because that's that's the slides that I was working with at the uh, at the time so the March 3rd low which we'll see in just a minute it's in fact it should be here okay, and there's the March 3rd low And this is what the question this is what the question revolves around. That low on March third was not completed. In other words, the auction was never completed, but the market rallied from there. Sometimes a market can get too short. And if a market can get too short, it can rally to alleviate itself of that condition. But that doesn't mean that that auction has been completed. So at one, say, at one side you say, well, there's acceptance there. On another side I say, but the auction was never completed. And as we'll see in, in uh, just a second here, uh, today's, i got to bring today's market up. It's not showing there yet. Oh, there it is. Over, it's coming up. As you see, today's low or the March 3rd low was taken out today when I was talking about when I was going about the slides talking about information and that information helps you assess the odds of going forward it gives you better references for example I've been carrying this reference forward and it was taken out and completed today all right a couple more questions before I go into talking about the slides just on what I talked about earlier because uh, the slides are going to tell, I'm not the slides, but the examples here are going to tell a much better story. Okay, one or two more questions and then I'll go into the examples that I want to talk about. Okay, great. And as an aside, several people are saying they've downloaded the slides um, from GoToWebinar, so maybe it's a browser setting for Firewall or something. Um, if you email us, jdaltontrading at gmail.com, um, I will send you the slides. Um, also, Jim, one other question. How should I understand, quote, regulates opportunity? The time regulates opportunity. Could you explain that for him? Yeah, a good, uh, a good opportunity shouldn't last very long. So if a market goes down and, and you leave single prints and it is rejected from there, that was a good opportunity. Um, just like it's any, the same concepts of any business are applicable to trading. If it's a good opportunity, it shouldn't be there very long. If it really wasn't such a good opportunity, it's there too long, it really wasn't a good opportunity. And that's why we came back through this. Did the market rally? Yes, it did. But it wasn't a good opportunity. Uh, it may have had some short covering, 
but you can see we've come back through it. Okay, let me go to the examples and let me show you what I'm talking about contrasting price with price with texture. I'm going to start using the example from the 7th of March. On the 7th of March, the green dot is the opening for that day. Okay, I'm hoping this is big enough for you to see. The yeah. green dot is the opening. The market then trades higher for most of the day. This is Friday the 4th. So by the time we get done with the, this is the settle on Friday the 4th. By the time we are done with the 7th, Monday the 7th, price was higher. So if you're trading price, price was higher on that day. We trade value, not price. Value is where two-thirds of the day's activity takes place. So the attempted direction on Monday was up. Price was clearly higher. The, the blue area here is value. This is Friday's value on the left. Monday's value was almost overlapping, but slightly lower. The longest line closest to the center of the range is, is right here the, with the green line. That is called the point of control. A better description of the point of control is the fairest price at which business is being, is being conducted on Monday. So the fairest price is here. The settle is far above the fairest price. So traders in the afternoon were getting long at prices above the fairest price for the day. So netting out this day, attempted direction is up. Value is overlapping to slightly lower. Price is higher. Also, if you look at the B period low on Monday, the B period low on Monday was a single tick above the opening. That is a very mechanical B period low. What that tells me from a behavioral standpoint is that short-term traders we're mechanically waiting for the market to go to that exact point of the opening price, and they bought it. They bought it. That was the low, second low for the day. And you'll see this market settles up here. And even though it came all the way back down in K&L period, the net, what I read a net from this day, is this was a weekday. It did not have good odds of upside continuation. And again, the reason are the reasons are there's the opening, tempted direction is up, value is overlapping to lower, and we trade value, not price. Price was higher. The fairest price at which business was being conducted did not migrate higher proportionally with price. In other words, Traders, this is the fairest price, but there were a lot of traders still buying in the afternoon. And why were they buying? Because they are more than likely priced-based traders. Priced-based traders were more than likely getting long on this day. Okay, so what I wrote, and we do a report every night for those that are in the intensive, said that the odds of upside continuation were not good. Okay, additionally, Monday was an inside balancing day. Okay, now let's carry forward. What happened on Tuesday? Remember, I already said we're looking at market generated information. We're not looking at price. We're looking at price with texture around it. And the texture around this or the other circumstances did not speak well for upside continuation. And you can see what happens. The market 
opens lower on Tuesday. It opens quite a bit lower, just before the low of the previous day, and immediately takes out this A and B period low. Remember, we stressed that this was a what we call a weak pullback low because it was mechanically at an exact price. Then the market trades lower on Tuesday. Nothing to be surprised about. Okay, now I'm going to, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about this day. I'm going to talk about this day in a minute. But before I talk about the following day, I want to answer any questions relative to the discussion we just had about why the seventh was not a good day. Why the odds of upside continuation were low and the odds of trading lower were high. Questions, please, Julia. Yes, can you please explain how you decided it was a poor low and why the auction was not completed? Sorry, I'm a little new to this. No apology okay. necessary. Thank you for asking. Okay, that's going back. That's going back to the third. And if an auction is completed, you will have single prints on the auction. Down here it wasn't. And you can see we're back there through that again. So that's where we're trading right now. We're trading lower today back through it. So that was not a completed auction, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the shorts or the traders didn't get enthusiastic for some reason and take prices higher. Traders do a lot of emotional things, a lot of emotional things. And remember, the majority of traders are not successful. So we're looking at what they're doing and seeing what kind of opportunities are they providing for us. So this is considered a poor low or an incomplete auction. This, the following day on Friday, was also a poor low. So that's what we call back to, two back-to-back -back poor lows. The odds, the odds of this situation remaining very long are very low. In fact, this is it's very unusual that this lasted as long as it did. But you can see on the 8th we did come back and complete or take this low and complete it. Okay, let's go back to the answer to the specific questions on why I saw Monday as a weekday and why I thought the odds were good that we would trade lower or uh, trade off on Tuesday. Well, connected to that, Jim, the question is, why didn't the point of control migrate higher? Okay. And what should have happened on this day for the POC to migrate higher during the session? Okay. When the point of control doesn't migrate higher, and that's just an excellent question, There's what we're trying to do there's, is trying to ascertain what is going on under the surface of a market. Anybody, if I ask, if I ask most people, what did the market do on this day, on the seventh? Oh, they would tell me, well, the market, the, the market was higher, uh, price was higher, and it was overall a pretty good day. And if they ask me, I said, well, what didn't happen is more important than what did happen. And yes, price was higher, but the fairest price. Why didn't the fairest price migrate higher? Because underneath the surface. There were sellers, they weren't day time frame in most cases, but there were sellers saying, you bought some. Very patient sellers. Every time price went up, they bought some. Or they sold some. Somebody with larger pools of capital were selling into that rally on Monday. And the, the, the smartest way for an intelligent seller to act is to sell price above value. So as, or, and this was the fairest price. So as price went continually above the fairest price, or what, as price went higher, there were smarter sellers saying, you bought some. Short-term traders following price take the market higher. They say it's an opportunity to buy. Smart, smarter money is saying, thank you, you bought some more. We used to see this down on the floor of, of exchanges. It was very common that 
when you went on a floor of exchange, you you always had in these pools, you had all kind of small traders. And almost every trading pit had two or three very large traders. And it wasn't uncommon for the one trader to be the largest of any in a pit. So what would happen a lot of times is you'll get the smaller traders in the pit buying, buying, buying. And all of a sudden, the larger trader, the really large trader understands these, these small traders have all followed each other. It's like a herd instinct. They've all gotten very long. And the smarter trader that understands that, this bigger trader, all of a sudden, and let's say they were buying. When you're in the pit on a floor, if the if your hands, palms are your hands are out and your palms are for you, towards you, towards your face, that means you're buying. So this smarter trader, he could see that most of the traders in the in the pit, the smaller traders, constantly had their palms facing their, their face. So they're buying. And he can sense very quickly that they're long. All of a sudden, this large trader in the pit, he would put his hands, palms away, hands above his head, palms away, and when he puts palms away, he's selling. So in effect, what he's doing, he is selling into those traders. Now, sometimes he did it subtly, and he just kept selling into them until they got too heavy in inventory, and then they, they, the market went down. Other times, he was just very gradually using that information to sell what he wanted to sell to them so that they would finally give up and the market would go lower. So that same, that's what happened on a floor. That same concept takes place off the floor, as a lot of small traders are chasing price higher, there and now electronically, there are other traders that see what's going on and they say, "You bought some, you bought some," and when that's going on, when underneath the surface there's sellers, then smaller traders are getting longer and longer, smarter, larger traders are selling to them. So, at this time, these a lot of these traders go home very happy. Because there was the low for the day, and a lot of times we find out that it's not uncommon for one either the higher or the low to be made early in the session. So the market goes the market goes higher. They go home and they're fat, dumb, and happy. They think they did very, very well. All of a sudden, you come in the morning and price opens substantially lower. They're all underwater. So what happens when you get a day like this? They're forced to liquidate. So that and that's quite that's quite common, but the information was here. It's a difference of price. If all you're looking at was price, this looked pretty good. If you're looking at price with texture and structure around it, it looked pretty. It looked quite a different picture. Okay, let me one more question there. Then I want to go on to the next day. Okay, we got two, or hopefully you can do it. Price uh, traders would see. March 7th as an inside day and sell the break lower. How is that a different view than the profile of the idea of lower prices? So they would see March 7th as an inside day and sell the break lower. How is that different? Yeah, well, sell the break lower. As an inside day, they, it's, they may see it as an inside day, but did they go home long? They're selling down here. I'm buying. I'm. I'm going short up here. I'm. I do it by buying puts. But I'm. I'm getting short up here at the 2,000 level, near the close of the day, because I see what the condition of the market is, and I say the odds of upside continuation are low, and the odds of a correction tomorrow are high. So, because I see the structure, my price is my price is getting short someplace in the 2,000 level, and they're getting short down here. That's quite a difference. That's that price up there is a just a little. That's 1998 something, and down here below this, that's a, a 1986 level. That's 1986 even. Uh, you know, that's a, that's 16, 18 point handles difference. That's quite a difference. So seeing what seeing what's going on. Remember, 
one of the things I said when I was going through the charts before, one of the things I said was it, it gives you, a, a, one, it, it's a good for your imagination, and it helps you plan future trades and, and strategies. And think of, it, think of it this way. If you have a clock, and the clock is numbered, you know, from, from the top all the way around, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. As the market's going up from 10 to 12, I can sell almost anything I want. The liquidity is there. I can sell into it. Once it's rounded 12 and it's down to, to 2, going down the other side, boy, it's a lot harder to sell right, th right there because now everybody wants to sell. And the way up, you know, you can, you, can, you can sell as much as you want and get good prices for it. On the way down, it's far different. Okay, J JT's got a question here. What is the reasoning behind why a weak or poor references, why are they revisited? Because the auction was not completed. You go to, you know, it's, it, another way to think about it is when this happens, think about it as a, uh, as a baseball game, when, you know, when we used to play outside. Baseball game uh, is postponed because of rain. You know, we're going to come back, we're going to come back and replay the game. So this idea of auction completion, remember, there's a lot of things going on in the market. And so much of what happens, if I introduce these concepts to you, over time, over time, you start to get an appreciation of a completed auction versus a non-completed auction. You know, it's like a ball game. It's called because of darkness, or it's, it's postponed because of rain. It's not completed. And it's, it's like any auction concept. If I went up, let's say I went to an art auction where the auction only goes one direction. The auction starts out, and the auctioneer, you know, he, he's moving pretty quickly. Um, I've got 1,000, 1,002, 103, and all of a sudden goes up, and the auction finally, you know, the last bidder bids at 106,000. If, in fact, he says, oh, you know, I forgot, I have another one just like that. If that auction was completed, and he brings the other one out, he shouldn't even come close to getting 106,000 for it. That auction, he shouldn't get any more than four or five for it. But all of a sudden, he brings out the piece, and he gets 106,000, 106 and a half for the next for the next piece that was exactly like the first one. Well, guess what? The auction was never completed. It wasn't, you know, and this happens all the time. Sometimes it's not completed because of the end of the day. Sometimes it's not completed because inventory got too short. Uh, and my guess would be, on a day like this, inventory probably got too short, so the auction didn't get completed. You get short inventory, and what happens? Market gets too short, and then it starts to rally. So the short covering rally, which what we call old business, old business actually weakens the market eventually because it removes potential buying power. But price-based traders when a short when a, when a short covering rally gets underway, price base and particularly momentum traders get long because they're only trading price. So they can take that those markets to extremes, and when they take those markets to extremes, watch out because that's when we come back down. We got those traders far too long, and now the, so the price base traders got too long, and when they're forced to liquidate. All of a sudden, you get the liquidation from them. Plus, you the the whole thing starts all over again. Now you get momentum traders um, chasing the market. They first they chase it up. Now they're chasing it back down. Okay, um, let me go over and let's go and take a look at the eighth. Okay, because what did I think on the eighth? I thought on the eighth. Um, I, I'm sorry, on the seventh. I thought there was a pretty good chance that we trade lower on the following day. Now let's examine the following day and do the same kind of analysis. So on, on this day, the opening is the green light. I'm going to split this out. I'm going to split this profile out to give you a little different view of it. So on this day, the market trades, opens, and trades lower. Okay? Not unexpected, right? Wasn't unexpected at all. So the attempted attempted direction is down. Market does trade lower, but we're still within a big broad trading range. Makes a low, 
and then the market starts to rally. Okay, I'm going to collapse this again. I just wanted you to see what it looked like early. Expectations were met, but it, it then breaks, and uh, my guess is that this low, uh, because it was a low, traders will still use it. And this actually makes the low less secure because we're getting more acceptance at that level. Okay, I'm going to, re re I'm going to re uh, collapse it. So attempted direction on this day is down. Now, one more time, look at the point of control. Another way for point of control is the fairest price at which business is being conducted. So we went from a market that was too long, got too long on one day, and then it gets too short the following day. So attempted direction is down, price is down, value is down, but here's the fairest price at which business is being conducted. If you draw a line from this fairest price down to the low, you will get what I call a 45 degree line. So if this is the 40, if this is the fairest price and traders are selling this market off in the afternoon, guess what? The day before they were getting long above the fairest price and on this day they're getting short the fairest, short below the fairest price. So what I wrote for this day that the odds, the odds, at least in the morning, of downside continuation were low. So once again, price was lower. So if somebody asked me what what had happened on the eighth, I say, well, you know, the market was down, it was off so and so, price was lower, blah blah blah. But when I look at it with context, I say, well, this day the traders got short term, traders got too long. This day they got too short. So where do we open? Where do we open the following day? We open higher. So this is the second day in a row we've done the opposite of what price did. Now, we also have something else. We have a poor high. In other words, this auction wasn't completed down here or here. This auction's now been completed. This auction wasn't completed. Then we get an inside day here. So again, the market opened, traded lower, the fairest price was up here. What I wrote that night, the 45 degree line, traders got caught short in the hole. Where, where did we open the following morning? We opened higher. Now, some people will say, I can't trade this market. It's all over the place. I look at this market and I say, I think the market's trade, tradable. Because what we do, one of the things that we cover in the intensives is we talk about psychology, but we talk about psychology from two points. First, we talk about our own personal psychology, but also importantly, we talk about the psychology of those that we are competing against. The people that are trying to take my money, they got too long at this day, thank you very much, I'm going to fade you. They got too short this day, thank you very much, I'm going to fade you again. So they're psych they're, what they're doing from a psychological level, I understand they're following price, they're going with momentum, and they're getting too long. Here, they're following price, they had to liquidate, they, then they went from too long to too short. And I'm looking, okay, I understand their psychology because they're, they're like a herd and they're following price one way, following price another way. When I look at texture, because I've got this organized, and we said the reason for organizing the data is to get a, a graphic allows you to simplify what you're looking at. It allows you to better study and interpret the data. And if I had this in one in one dimension, like we said, if one dimension price was higher, one dimension price was lower. When I look at this as a two-dimensional, three-dimensional view, I get a whole different perspective. When I look down here in a three-dimensional view, I get a whole different perspective than if I was just looking at price. And of course, you can see what happened yesterday. What did the market do yesterday? It went up and it took care of these shorts and we opened we opened higher. So, I mean, this, this goes on and on and on. And, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not here to teach the whole course in, uh, in, you know, one webinar setting. I'm here trying to introduce you to a whole different way 
to look at and start to appreciate the market. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. Why is it going to be easy? One, because most people are bringing a lot of baggage with them from the way they've traded in the past. So that has to be sometimes jettisoned in order to open your mind to get a better imagination of what can be done when you're taking a three-dimensional view of the market. And it's entirely it's entirely different perspective on the market. Look at this. This is the stuff that goes on. Yesterday, the, the point of control is, is very here, very prominent. The more prominent a point of control is, the fairest is the fairest price. The, and you could trade above it or below it, the higher the odds that we're coming back to it. What happened this morning? Oh boy, ECB, ECB, they're, they're, they're going to flood the market with money. Or things are going to be great. Traders couldn't wait to go out and buy this before the opening. They couldn't wait. To, you know, it's just a hard infect instinct. All I have to do is is buy price movement. Okay, before the opening, we were all the way back down here. Then the market rallied again, and then what happened? We got up near. This is the trading range. This is the high of the recent trading range. So we spend a lot of time talking about trade location. So when they get back up here, the high of the recent trading range, you know, be careful. This is a very high risk reward level. So traders got themselves very long this morning, then they got long again, and guess what? Down they came. This, uncom this auction that wasn't completed, we're now back through it. We're now back through it. Now it's been completed. Um, and, you know, this goes on and on and on. The way you, the, the, the reason that we did the intensives really was because of, of Julia. We, we would do seminars. We'd go to hotels and we'd do a three to five day seminar and our webinar or seminar. And you know, and we get a lot of applause at the end. Uh, the last one we did in Chicago, uh, you know, I came in in the morning and I said, based on what I saw, this may be one of these days that we open and trade lower and then trade higher at the close. And, and this is all on this is all recorded on video and you and it's if you buy the uh, uh, the live market seminar it's all there you hear the applause at the end the market rallies 40 or 400 points I think it was in the last uh, 45 or 46 minutes boy don't we look good and the applause and I said boy that's wonderful I was very frustrated because understanding how the market got down there, was so important to understand the inventory conditions. And then with just before this rally started, I said, is anybody still short? And because the market had been going down for three or four days. And there were a lot of people and they were still short the market. And then a couple of a couple of uh, uh, chuckles. And then the market rallies four hundred points. That didn't come out of nowhere. Some people would say, well, there's no way to trade these markets. They couldn't understand that. That's just 400-point rally. It's out of nowhere. No, it wasn't out of nowhere. The market was setting up for that. The craziness of traders getting too long or too short, too short in that case, was, was building. And all of a sudden, one's following the other, and the momentum trader, one momentum trader is following the other momentum trader, and all of a sudden, away the market goes to the upside. I mean, and those things happen all the time. And it was interesting. Uh, Julie and I were at a, uh, well, let me finish the last. So I was very frustrated, because, and the reason I was frustrated is because even though people thought we did a great job, I didn't feel that we were really giving traders something that they could take home and use. It, it, you, can't, you can only learn so much in three to five days. And so anyhow, and, and Julie came up with the idea to address my frustration is how about doing a an intensive and an intensive where we are use the computer use modern modern technology and extend it over and I think the first one we did was over two months to extend it over two months so you see different markets different situations and really have a fair chance to allow traders to make a change two months was too long for me um, you know, back to back. So then we altered it, and then we did, we did 
just one intensive, which was a month. And But we'd start by giving people maybe a few weeks before it started our daily report at the end of each day and, uh, and then the morning report to update what's gone on overnight. And, and that helped. That, that started to give people time to assimilate what we're talking about, to jettison some of the junk that they carried with them in the past that was price-based, gather some you know, understanding of what we're doing. You're not going to put this all together immediately. The first book I wrote, Mind Over Markets, takes you through five steps of learning. It's written from the point of view of being a concert pianist. Here's a piano. It's got white keys and black keys. And, you know, that's that's a novice. And then, you know, a beginner. Then you go to a novice. Then you go to competent. It's competent. You can play Beethoven exactly as it's written. To go from competent to proficient and finally expert, you have to jettison a lot of the rules that got you to competent in the first place. There has to be you know, certain principles that you follow to get you to competent. But to really become an expert or proficient and an expert at trading and really make money, you have to get rid of some of the things that got you to, that got you to the first step. For example, when we talked about, somebody asked about the low on the third. Okay, we'd say it's not a completed auction, but then the other thing we say, well, prices were accepted there. Well, you know, and, and that was the basic rules, but over time, you understand, all right, wh what does this mean? Yes, it's not completed, but why did it end up that way? Maybe because the market was too short. My initial book was Mind Over Markets. A couple of years ago, I did a second edition to that book, and that book was like 20 years old. One of the things that I talked about in there was these poor highs and lows. And my guess is that when I first learned the profile, the poor highs and lows probably cost me a quarter million dollars because I put too much confidence in them. And I didn't understand. I thought the poor low wasn't completed, so if I was short, I'd wait for it to come back through there. Well, it cost me a lot of money until I, you know, it took me a couple of years and a lot of money to figure out that yeah, there's a reason for that, probably because the market got too short. So then I started to learn what are the conditions that lead to a market being too short. How do I see that? It takes a lot of time to learn. But then you move forward, and it takes a lot of time, to, particularly to move from the rules to get you to competent, then to go to proficient and expert. But remember, the competition is tough. So that's why we do the intensives. And now what we're in the process right now is, you know, doing a couple back to back, but you know, there's a few weeks in between. So we're still sending the reports out. For example, the next intensive starts on April the fourth. But if you join up now, you're already getting you start getting the report at the end of the day, which will cover things like points control that didn't migrate higher and lower, etc. Talk about volume. And then we'll update it at the uh, uh, for the morning, see what's happened overnight, and then we do some chat comments throughout the day. They're not as heavy as when the intensive's on, but in order to for people that are starting now, you've got till April 4th to get some kind of a background to make more sense out of what happens in the final intensive that I'm going to do. So anyhow, that's what's going on, and as you can see, there's a tremendous amount to learn. But you are competing. Remember, the, the record for people trading is very poor. You are competing against people that have done this for years. There are very few people that are going to share the information that we are willing to share with you. Because when people have this information, they like to keep it very proprietary. Why would I give this to anyone? And so you don't, you don't get many people willing to share. That's what we do. We share nuances and small pieces of information that you're not going to get in many places. Anyhow, I've talked too much. I'm very sorry. Uh, I probably got a little hyper when it didn't work to begin with. Julia, we're um, um, we're running well, out of time. We have so uh, let's we started answer a few 15, questions. Yeah, we started 15 minutes late, so we'll go for the hour. Um, during the day, how do you use the opening and ending of periods? Um, do you use the opening and ending of 30-minute periods to execute trades, you know, to get in no. and get out? 
No, I do not. But I've noticed that that there's a lot of people that do because you'll see a flurry of activity as you change over to the 30 minute period. And sometimes that sometimes that will give me an edge. You know, if I think the market's going lower and somebody's got some system that says buy at the end of the 30 minutes and they take it up four or five ticks, that may give me the opportunity I wanted to go to go short. No, that is nothing to do with what we do. That would be a price based system. And we're everything but price based. Another question. For today, G period is weak. Well, I don't know, Francesco, can you tell me if you're talking about today? Um, G period, okay, yeah. G period high is weak, but do you consider F period high weak as well because it is a tick shy of the 1983.25 reference? It's uh, it's uh, 1983 is a number we've been using. I, I just I don't see it particularly weak. It just it's just a crazy crazy day. It's uh, what happened in F period. If you have a, a a trend day from the high, trend day from the high. So there's B period, C period took out the B period low, D period one time framing lower. Very often in a trend day, the market will stop one time framing one time. And what I see is that F period stopped one time framing one time. Stopping means it took out the prior bar by a couple of ticks. And what that does is normally allow the inventory to come back into balance. So I think more than anything else, traders were using these single prints as a reference. Uh, but I don't see it as a particularly weakness. It's just kind of a very visual type of, of reference. Okay? Okay. How do you treat references? We had an earlier question from Martin, and now Barnes is asking, how do you treat references carried forward on the contract role? I go to the new contract, just like today. Um, you know, this I still have March up because that's what the, the when we were preparing for the seminar for the webinar this morning, we were using March. Now we've rolled to June. I just go and I look at the uh, what the June contract shows. Uh, for example, here, if I go over to June, there's the June contract. And we're talking about the, the there's the recent trading range high. I, I, whoops. Uh, that may be overnight. So the recent trading range high. I think in the pit session was the 1998 level. So we would have used that and we came close to it today. So adjust. There was a, there's a gap up here. Um, I forget exactly. It's a, but there's a gap up here on the, on the June contract. So we use that. We go to the contract that is currently trading. And the reason we do that is that is what the traders that are the most active traders, those are the references that they're going to see and look at. What does a completed auction look like? On a day time frame basis, the profile on 3.7 we talked about earlier, it was completed on the upper end, it was completed on the lower end. Because you had excess, it went high enough to cut off the buying, it went low enough to cut off the selling. So if you go to an auction, say the auctioneer tries to open the auction at $100, $100. nobody will open the auction at $100. In other words, you know, nobody will raise the bid at $100. So what does he do? He drops it to, maybe he drops it down to $97. At $97, $97 the auction gets underway. I got $97, I got $97 and a quarter, a half, three quarters, $98, $98, $99, $99, $99 and a half. That auction was completed on the downside. So that's a daily auction when you look here. It's completed on the downside and the upside. That's a completed auction. This is not a completed auction because there's no, there's this completed on the high, not completed on the low. Now, you can't look at that by itself. You have to look at that, and you know, as we said, this auction wasn't completed, and it may have been that there was too many shorts. It's been completed now. It's gone back, and what we called went back and repaired that poor reference. So we that carry that information, poor low, we carry that information forward. But that always affects the odds. That affects the odds of, 
upside continuation. I came in today with quite a few uh, quite a few puts on this market, and part of it because it didn't look like it was completed on the downside. Okay, couple more questions. Yes, today's point of control is at exact yesterday's low and still inside the two days balance. Do you think it is doing a good job uh, getting going lower? What are the is, odds of a substantial is, rotation back up? There is no point of control on a trend day. This is a trend day down. There is no point of control. That's a terrible mistake people make. Um, there will always be some places the wide that's closest to the center of the range. But there is no, no point of control on a trend day. Okay, a couple more. Has Jim commented on today's week high, one tick above the 7th, March 7th high? I don't consider that, because uh, that high had, had been, uh, no, I guess you're right. Um, no, I didn't comment on that. It, it, you're right. You're right. No, I didn't comment on that. I didn't. I didn't catch it. I was so looking at other information. Yeah, it, that's one. It's but keep in mind, it's it's a single data point. It's a single data point. No, but you're right. That's a good. That's a good observation. Okay. Okay. Two more. Two more questions, and then we'll do a wrap up. I have to check out of the hotel. Okay. Um, is Jim still focusing on the inability to hold the 1983 level? Have we gone from bull to balance to bear, or is this more likely a rebalancing of inventory before continuing upward? Okay. I, I, here's what I think. When, for those that don't know, 1983 was the dividing line between two distributions and it's going to take me a while uh, because when this thing shut down I had the bar charts up to show you that but um, let me see if I can get this open and it'll take a, a little while for for thinkorswim to open but then I will talk about that and I I want you to see what I was seeing and incidentally um, we, I did an, uh, an interview the other night with um, Peter Reznicek, and that was one of the things, and I think he's making that available for people that buying something new related to the... Uh, um, we can see your screen, Jim. Kurt, I know you can. Uh, related to the, uh, um, the the final intensive that I'm going to do, and we focus quite heavily on that 1983 level in that in that discussion, and so you'll see that if if anybody you know sees that tape, you'll see that. But I'm going to show you right now for a second why that is so why I think that is so important, and this will be up in a. I hope I have enough internet to bring this all up. Um, I'm working on my Verizon. Jetpack. So far, we're almost through this. Uh, I Jim, don't know what went on early. But there's, there's a comment yeah. here, Jim, that the you may not have saw that high as weak up there at the March 7th high because it's not weak on the June contract. Oh, okay. You just put the March on for the presentation for the slides earlier in the week. So good. Okay. Good. Good way. comment. And, and I, I would it. look at the. I would take what was the front month. Yep. Can. Okay, you can get to the 83 level. Yeah, it's going to be just a second while this populates. Um, it's a little bit slow in here. How about this? Well, you got that loaded ES? It's trying. Okay. Okay. Make this just a little bigger. Jim. Will I unmess this up? No, that's Is crude. Just a second. You put crude. I know, no, no, no. Oh, it's okay. Oh, I you know did that. that on purpose to reset it. Yes. Sorry about that. That's yes. the only way I can get it. Reset. Okay. Okay. It's going to be here in a minute. One more time. I'm going to try and make it just a little bigger. 
So then I'm going to try and move it over. Okay. This is this red line right here is the 1983 level. What I saw is an upper distribution and a lower distribution. The market rallied back into this distribution, but look how many times it's been below it. One, two, three times below it. And so what I'm saying, if this, if we're really going to get some, get into this distribution and get some legs, the upper distribution, we ought, this upper distribution, we ought to move away from this lower level or this 83 level that bifurcates these two with some authority. We didn't do it. We went up above it. We came back. We went up above it. We came back. We came back, and we're back again today. So when I looked at this, it just looked to me like the momentum price-based traders were still buying every rally, or I'm buying, I'm sorry, buying every break relative to the, um, the 1,800, 1,804 low or so. And that's what goes on, That because that's worked. So they buy every break. They were getting less and less for it. Think of it this way. If you took, say, a quarter and spun the quarter on your desk, you get big movements to begin with, and then that quarter goes lower and lower and lower until all of a sudden it goes flat. That's what I saw going on up here. It would look above it, ah, oh, they get a little pop out of it, and then it comes back, and they get less and less and less. So I was saying, I'm looking and I'm saying, I think this is very, very tired, very tired, and I think what we've got is just, we, we do a lot with the diffusion model, and it's another thing, it takes some time to understand, but we talk about the behavior of traders, and it goes from, you know, the innovators, the first people in, the early adopters, second in, early majority, late majority, and finally the laggards. So I think what was going on up here is the laggards were getting in. The laggards were getting in, and that's usually the end of the that's usually the end of the market. The innovators were down here, early adopters, then you get the early majority, late majority, and this to me were the laggards that were coming in. And they weren't getting much for it. So I still see this as very important. Now, I wrote something today, and I'm not a technician, but I do know what the technicians are talking about. They're, and you know, people will call me and say, well, Jim, do you use moving averages? No, I don't use moving averages. Why don't I use moving averages? Because they're price-based. Why don't I move, uh, use Bollinger Bands? Because they're price-based. I don't use price-based information, but I do understand technically what's going on out there. The 200-day moving average is falling, and so if people got all excited, they'd, oh boy, Jim, we're at the 200-day moving average, and I said, so what? What is important to me? I don't care what reference you're using. What I want to see is what happens at that reference. So when you come up, if you're coming from below and you're coming up to the 200-day moving average, you want to give above it, you want to come to that reference with volume, with structure, and with authority. And But if you come to it weak, then it's probably not going to make, make it through there, just like a Bollinger Band. You move out to one of the bands, and you know it may snap back for you if you go out there on weak volume, and it's kind of a puny market going to that, the Bollinger Band may work perfectly. You go out there it's strong with, with volume, with structure, and we talk about structure and intensity, and now trying to fade that using a band, you're going to get wiped out. You have to understand the context of what has happened. So anyhow, this is why I'm so focused on this 1983 level versus the March contract. Also, and we don't have time here, but this structure coming up was very weak, looked like a lot of short covering, and uh, and on a lot of over enthusiastic traders. Okay, finally, because I got to get out of here in a couple minutes and check out. Um, Jim, can you explain, uh, discuss a trend day in a balancing range? Like we have today, okay. you've identified it as a trend day. Um, well, it's a, tr it's a trend day. I mean, you just see it's a trend day because it's just one time framing. You know, and that's that's all it is. And it can be within a balancing range. It can be as a breakout. In a balancing range, the objectives become the one end of the trading range to the other, if it can make it. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. One more question. Um, I'm with you guys. 
The five anomalies from March 7th, did they reduce the odds of downside continuation as that profile we were reviewing was printing? What is the significance of those anomalies on the 7th? He was asking, does it reduce, do they have higher odds of being repaired? Well, they've been repaired. This, well, the seventh. Anything. The se yeah. This is the seventh or is right. this the seventh? That is the left. Okay. Yeah, they've all been repaired. They've, we've traded back. The day. Yep. Yeah, we've, we've traded back through anything, so anything there has been repaired. Right. right. That's just to explain the anomalies, why you point them out. And, 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 we, and we talk a lot about anomalies. and we, we don't have time to go into it here. This is not a full educational session. But anomalies occur when a market is acting an emotional, in a very emotional manner. Let me show you some. Uh, we, we see this in crude all the time. Um, look at this market the other day. Anomalies, anomalies, anom anomalies are rough edges. They're rough edges. Anomaly, 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 anomaly. They they occur usually when there's a tremendous amount of emotional buying. Oh my God! I've just I've got to have this. I either got to cover short or I have to I have to have it. Anomalies very often are retraced in relatively short order. You can see the market retrace some of those anomalies the following day. All of those anomalies have been replaced today, and the market's trading down here now. So it's it's again it's another piece that we study and talk about in the intensives. And you're not going to learn it in one session. You know, a lot of people. You know, we've got about there's about a hundred trading articles, and how many videos uh, do you think? I think over 85 now. Yeah, so there's a hundred articles, over 85 videos. So you go through the intensive, and like I say. If you're going to join us for the April 4th last intensive, you want to get signed up now. You want to get as much of the, or the reports that we're sending out. You want to get as many as the chat comments. And you want to have time to read some of those articles and look at some of those videos in order to build that background to make the intensive more meaningful to you going forward. You're not going to get it from a couple hours. If you're talking about being able to compete, with the world at large, it's going to take some work and it's going to take some time. Part of it's going to be unlearning. I'm attacking price pretty hard because I think I think price is why people focused on price is what almost everybody does, and I think that's what misleads people so much and causes so much emotion. We want to focus on deeper things like value, what's really taking place, what's going underneath the surface, what's what's the fairest price relative to the price that you see recorded, you know, for margin purposes and in the paper and everything else. There's a lot of pieces to put together. You're talking about I've been doing this for 40 years, and there's a lot of things I've learned. And incidentally, my biggest advancement came in the last two years. Biggest advancement in my whole career came in the last two years when I started to understand the importance of weak references. And you know, poor references versus weak references, they tell me an awful lot about what is the psychology of the people that I am competing against. Anyhow, I hope you join us for our final intensive. I want to say thank you to everyone for being here today and um, sign off. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. We'll have this recording up. And uh, please check your inbox uh, tomorrow for the webinar series for March. There'll be two a week for the remainder of the month. So that will be coming to you soon. And thank you for being here. Have a great afternoon or wherever you're at. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.